Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. <laughs> that would make me carry. <laughs> Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. <laughs> Yay, good morning. <laughs> Thank you. All of the daddy lovers are going to be like, oh my God, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I grew wow. the spirit out just for you, Damon. Oh, thanks. Need something. something. <laughs> well, sitting in the evening, at, like recording for four plus hours, going past like nine o'clock, ten o'clock. So maybe this is better because then there wouldn't have been any way to have dinner for some of us. Just saying. So, that's all. <laughs> oh, uh, so, um, and I can't remember how this came about. Drew, I think you and I kind of had a discussion about um, this or it leading into it. Oh, oh, I sent you oh, link. yes, they, yeah, it, duh, it just occurred to me because I didn't even put it on the list. Bad, Gary. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically through the course of the pandemic, we as a community have been seeing announcements um, of various kinds uh, in, in two camps, basically, I feel like LGBTQ spaces are either fundraising because they haven't been existing as a as an income business of any kind uh, through the pandemic, and or they're just outright closing. Mm -hmm. Now, the closing of spaces has been an ongoing trend for some time. Mm -hmm. So, like we we kind of have known about that, and I think we've discussed it in variable ways in past shows. We haven't done perhaps a, a specific topic on it, but yeah. Uh, I forgot that you had sent me uh, the information um, that really kind of kicked this off as, a, as an idea, as a topic, because one of the landmark locations um, in the United States that was an entertainment draw um, and a hot spot uh, that I have actually been to uh, when Drew lived in Orlando, Florida, was the Parliament House. And not only is it closed, it is gone. Yeah. Um, the most recent uh, links or information I think Drew and I shared back and forth was uh, that it's been raised. Like, oh wow, yeah, yeah. I sent a picture of all the demolished rubble that was left. <laughs> um, and it and it got me thinking about you know like how there's been this I don't want to call it a movement but a noticeable like existence that um you know we're losing our quote-unquote gay spaces and gay just being a broad term for everything in the lgbtq uh, community most of these uh entities or spaces are venues um for entertainment for socializing um yes they all pretty much have a liquor license attached to them in some fashion uh, they could be a club they could be a, a dance bar they could be a hole in the wall um mm -hmm. they could potentially be a multifunctional space that includes a community center. Um, there's just a, a lot of things, but understandably, unless you rightfully own the square footage of your space and have paid it off, then like you've got a huge bill that you got to pay for rent or for lease or a mortgage, something on top of insurance and you know the utilities. Um, right to keep to keep that space 
so to speak, yeah. functional. Um, so, you know, as the pandemic swept across the globe, you know, our space is, you know, kind of faced financial devastation. And while there have been here in the U.S. some attempts at government programs to help small businesses, yeah. um, I haven't really heard very much positive about that experience. And it seems every week there's another headline about another entity that was re rewarded millions of dollars that all these Riddler type question marks pop up around it. Like, mm -hmm. bitch, why'd you need 37 million for that? Like, huh? Yeah. Like, is that really considered a small business? So, um, and I think, and I think that that questioning that, you know, doubt comes from a perspective of when you drive across your local area and you see places boarded up. And mm -hmm. I don't mean places boarded up because there might be, you know, an uh, unintentional violent act. Mm -hmm. Um, in the streets, I mean, boarded up because like, it just not they there anymore. They closed right. down, yeah. So um, we did actually talk about something similar um, back on COL 441, the fall of gay bars. I wasn't there, but it was you and Jeff and um, um, oh, we had um, guest Edward Angelini Cook on that episode. So for that, yeah. So that's one. That's a quick. Google, um, Google. <laughs> search of the CubsOutloud.com um, page where you can go and listen to all of our past and current episodes. Ding. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I, I will say this for my hometown here in Erie. Uh, at one time in my lifetime, the most uh, establishments we had was three mm -hmm. um one was considered a sleazy a sleazy little hole in the wall um <laughs> that ended up closing after it had been uh uh i don't know what i want to call that like rated well no i want to say it's like a hate crime and uh -oh. i want to say also the category of a firebomb and it's not quite the same thing oh. um, but someone intentionally tried to set the place on fire tiny little bar on fire with like a Molotov or some shit. Oh yeah. Gross. Um, so we kind of burned out and it's gone. Um, and that space, what's interesting is the, where the bar actually was is now an outdoor patio connected to another bar next door. Uh, <laughs> nice. So like the men's group, we had dinner there once and they were talking about how ironic it was to be out gay men sitting at a table, having a meal together in the exact same square footage of space where there used to be a gay bar that mm. people, you know, went to on the DL and like, you know, oh, and it all sorts of like, so it was one of those things. kind of bars. Well, to be fair, like the, the, the community in Erie at that time didn't really have many out locations. And True. so like people, uh, you know, tried to keep all that on the quiet anyway. So we, at the most we had three then we had two that we had a different two and now we have one and we still have one to this day. However, they are struggling, understandably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, so we haven't quite been affected, but yeah, we're not, we're not over through it yet. Yeah. Um, when I moved here in Cincinnati in 2002, 2003, there were 11 to 20. If I, the, the number 11 is popping in my head, but I feel like that's an understatement. But there were a lot of, of spaces um, of varying types, of varying degrees. It, it surprised me how many there were. Um, and that was really, it was really good to see and hear about. And did I go to all of them? I mean, I may have visited a few at least once. I think I hit every bar at least once, I think. But it's been so long. Mm -hmm. um, but now... Um, other places, a lot of places have closed due to um, corporate expansion and, and building new places and all of that stuff. Like, some of them were downtown. Nowadays, oh gosh, I want to say there's a handful. I'm not saying it's like, <clears throat> I want to say it's less than 10. Um, and they are surviving. Um, some have to. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the the best situation to be in, but you you're doing the best that you can. Um, 
I don't I've not heard of any actual closures of spaces here because of the pandemic, which I think is a blessing in disguise, but I have heard of bars that are um struggling. You know, um back when the pandemic first was kind of a big thing and hitting and a lot of places closed and then they allowed them to reopen. Um there was an initiative in the area to like these bars got together and said we are going to follow all the protocols and policies and procedures of the CDC we're going to you know mandate mask and we're going to have you you know social distance as much as possible we're going to you know cut our um you know size of of our attendance in half or whatever according to those rules and we did all of that and they all kind of agreed to do it because there were other spaces that were not that were kind of intentionally like just come in and and you know to give us your money for lack of a better phrase like like just give us your money because we we need the money and so who cares about like if you get sick or whatever like like just come and be gay or be whatever and so this was kind of an initiative to like go against that like we want to keep you safe as much as possible and i think that helped in a lot of ways in maintaining and helping the spaces that are still around um a bar actually if i remember correctly a space actually opened i think they're pansexual but um they opened during the pandemic they had they delayed their opening because of it, but they eventually open. And as far as I know, they're still doing well. Um, but again, they're the the spaces I think that are staying open mostly are staying open because they are following the guidelines and keeping people safe as much as possible. And that's I think customers are are the clientele are responding to that. Um, like I know I can go there, have a good time and know that I'll be at least in some way safe. If that makes mm -hmm. sense, like I know that I'll, I'll, I can res be, re it, they're respecting my personal health and safety, but still allowing me to be here. And that's kind of resonating positively with the, um, with the audience, with the clientele, so. Yeah. <clears throat> for me, I, 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 it's kind of unique for me because the last, what, seven, eight years, I've lived in three cities now. Uh, That's years sure. in Florida, then moved back to Toledo, now I'm back up north in, in my hometown of Traverse City. And I, I've seen different variations of closings and, and going on, even before the pandemic, where we had a change in our spaces and with people. So people were trying to redefine their space to keep the crowds with the internet and easy connections everywhere else like that. So I saw a lot of opens and closings, changes, renamings, rebrandings, uh, trying to keep that alive. Um, and then with the pandemic, yes, it uh, it's made it harder. So seeing Parliament House here, it was closing. And then my uh, uh, a military buddy of mine sent me a picture of the building demolished. And it was like, that's 45 years of history. Yeah. I remember going down there when I was in, uh, in the military back in the mid 80s. Uh, I did a road trip to Florida and that was one of the first places I checked. And then when I lived there, seeing how it had modified and changed itself over the years, to stay open and being the thriving iconic place that it was, um, it was just kind of a like wow. It, it's sort of hit you like this is gone. It's and there's one next to it was Full Moon Saloon. It sort of helped. The, it went the same way. They just never reopened, um, mm -hmm. and that was before the pandemic. So I see that, and then in Toledo, uh, we used to have like five or six bars, and now we're down to one. Mm -hmm. um, and we were at three for the last few years. And then just as this all hit, um, middle, middle, beginning, middle of last year, the last one, which was a dual bar side by side, lipsticks for drag and uh, mojos, um, closed their doors. So now we only have one left. Mm -hmm. um, and 
just like with Parliament House, Mojo's made the comment that they are going to be looking for a new place to reopen and what have you um, at another location. But I just... I've heard that from a lot of other places. I've never really see it come to fruition because of everything that's going on, the money, the cost. And when you don't have an income, how are you going to find to start a new place along that line yeah. to get back started? Yeah. And then you've got my hometown here, which is, has only had one gay bar as long as I've known it. We used to have a little rental hall parties before we had a bar, but it's surviving and it's still here. And as much as, we talk about changing dynamics in the club. If it wasn't for the straight and college clientele that are coming into it now or have been over the last few years, it would probably be closed to mm. because that's that's the majority of people I see now because it's more of a dance club than it is just a gay club. Um, so they've reinvented themselves in sense of the personnel wise, but that I think that's the one factor that's keeping them open. Um, and I haven't heard anything else on that aspect yet. I know they have a patio out back so people can sit outside. Um, and we just reopened up a little bit. So, uh, so yeah, it's just various varying experiences from all the three cities on, on different levels and, and what the effects are. Yeah. I think the, the, I think one of the things that the greater community uh probably struggles with accepting or understanding or i don't know being aware of is that like our spaces are maintained by us yeah like so uh like at the beginning of the current like uh liberation phase of, of humanity i guess i want to say mm -hmm. for the lgbtq community a lot of the bars were not gay owned and operated they were mm -hmm owned and operated or at least owned by other entities so like a lot of people like to talk about the raid on stonewall and mm -hmm. that it was you know russia i think it's russian mafia um and you know basically it was kind of a you had to pick and choose your battles because like you know there's been rumors that the drinks were overpriced that the bar owners were like like you know padding the palms of the police yet mm -hmm. the police would do the raids like you know what i mean like so it was you know one mm -hmm. of these situations where you were you know damned if you didn't damned if you didn't yeah so you forward through the decades and you know bars and establishments locations become gay owned enterprises however it's still a business it still has to operate still has to have a profit margin um and on top of that like it's run by people so I know even in my hometown here, like we've had some issues over the years about, you know, bar ownership, bar management and, you know, my my life expectancy, um, you know, perspective on this side of things is like, yeah, they're just human beings. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, what what do they know? Yeah. Um, and if they're not very good business people, then they won't operate a very good business, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that's that's very true. Like sometimes I don't think people understand what they're fully getting into until it's too late. And I'm talking like just like the like let's open a gay bar, like let's do it and da 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 and then you go through all the things and you get the licenses and you open the bar and maybe it's successful for a while, but then things change. You know, life what we'll, we'll, we've all kind of admitted it now, like like and probably in that last episode things have changed recently overall you know we talk about the internet and i don't want to blame just the internet i think a lot of it is just we've discussed this before where the spaces were meant to be where we could be ourselves well now we can kind of be ourselves anywhere you know for the most part don't get me wrong like it <laughs> like yeah but because of that we don't necessarily need designated spaces and the people who own the bars are trying the best to figure out what to do, but they may not have the knowledge, experience, education um, necessary to like come up with new things or make things different or <laughs> like balance the books, as it were, do we the accounting that needs to be done to maybe cut costs somewhere so that you don't have to raise the prices of this or um, like come up with like 
savvy, you know, eye catching um, advertisement so that people maybe will be like, oh, I've not been here before and like come in, you know, kind of. So we, they don't have those experiences. Like you said, they are human. And like humans, sometimes we come up with ideas and we may not be the greatest at, at implementing them. So mm -hmm. we end up with a that kind of issue where they don't necessarily know, they, they, they may not know what they're doing or they're not 100% sure about what to do. So they try to do everything or they try to, or they can't do anything or they do nothing. And the business essentially is the one that suffers for it. Um, I think there was a situation with one of the bars here in town that wanted to be a rivaling drag show bar to one here that was quite popular. And it turned out that the people didn't know what the fuck they were doing. Like, I'm just I'm like, blunt and honest, they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. And they, they essentially, their, part of their marketing was essentially trying to like compete. Like that was mm. their, their big thing. And it was like, um, you don't need to compete if you like maybe do something different with your space. And, um, they were never like they got this space downtown and it was not a good space. It was honestly pretty crappy and they, they fixed it up, but they didn't fix it up fully. And things like you would go in and you would hear about how like things were falling apart, et cetera, et cetera. So they did something really quickly, but they didn't know what they were doing. And it ended up closing very quickly um, because they really didn't know anything about anything. And this is like well before the pandemic, but I can't imagine a now with the pandemic, you have a lot more things you have to think about and consider as you're making a space and opening a space or have a space open and are 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 trying to bring in an audience. Um, overall, people are scared. Like I'm, I will admit that I haven't been to a bar in months, almost a year, I want to say, just because I don't, I I'm doing some things, but I'm not doing everything. And the idea of being in a space that I don't think know for sure it's going to be properly prepared mm. for for the protocols and stuff. I, I I don't you know I don't know. I have issues going to restaurants now just because of that reason. But like, just add into that the fact that you can essentially sit at a table and if you've got a drink in your hand the entire time, you can be without a mask because you're technically drinking. You know, you don't need the mask on, you know, to to sit there. But it could be a little bit daunting trying to think about how to make this work. And some spaces, honestly, are not big enough, just point blank period, to make it profitable. If you cut the amount of people that can be in the space in half in order to maintain social distancing, that's a, an effect. That's a factor. Then right. you have to make sure that the spaces are separated enough to where they're separated from each other to maintain those distances. Then that kind of negates a lot of space that you can use, which can be, again, depending on the size of the bar, can be problematic. Um, and I don't, again, I don't think any bar, restaurant, whatever was planning on something like this happening. But now that we know, it's like, what can you do? You either have mm -hmm. to try to roll with it and try to stay open um, <laughs> or you have to close, you know? Right. Um, some spaces are being limited in, like here in Cincinnati, we have a curfew of 11 every night until further notice, mm -hmm. um, which I'm just going to be honest, like, most spaces are like that's when they start thriving is around that 10 30 11 o'clock mark right and that's definitely hitting against what they can do um the one of the one of the good bars here in town has been making the, the strides and has been doing the best that they can they have the owners own two and they're doing everything that they can and I think it's working. They haven't had any issues. They've not mentioned anything about needing to fundraise or anything along those lines, which is always a, a plus. Mm -hmm. But 
I can't tell you if it's really, really 100% working, but I have to assume that it is considering that they've maintained being open for quite a while during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you know, and the, the factors you bring up, especially about like attendance, um, operational hour limitations, like all of that is becoming factors as well as the weather. Like we are mm -hmm. in the month of February of 2021. And so, you know, when this, you know, weather changes in, in terms of the season, it makes it that much more challenging mm -hmm. for a majority of the U.S. to be operational with outdoor aspects because nobody wants to be outside. Um, <laughs> so, I don't want to be outside. You know, um, and that's one of the things I saw that did happen last summer, like around here, was a lot of operations put up temporary spaces outdoors, you know, uh, the city allowed a certain amount of like square footage from a sidewalk to be used. I mean, just mm -hmm. things along those lines kind of came about because everyone was so used to having an indoor space mm -hmm. and not everybody has the capital available to make the modifications necessary. Like, um, one of the first things I learned about early in the pandemic was about that a lot of businesses, and it doesn't matter what the kind of business, uses recirculated air which means that the heating and or cooling system takes the current air of the space and just raises or drops the temperature recirculates it mm -hmm. so it's not an external flow of air coming in and then going out mm -hmm. part of that is because it can be more expensive to heat or cool fresh air and then you know have things uh get exhausted in a way um, that's one perspective, but you know, the when studies were being shown, you know, coming out of China about how businesses that used airflow in a mechanism that it comes in and goes out like across a space had much less, you know, viral um, tracing, you know, opportunities of infection going on because the air wasn't being static, so to speak, or spread around against a population um, without them knowing. So I think about that in terms of, you know, how businesses want to be operational, but, you know, not everyone has that kind of capital, you know, to be no. like, oh, let me, let me put it a whole new, like, yeah. airflow system of some kind with UV, you know, ionization, blah, 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 like whatever might be the thing that people think technology-wise is going to help a space. Um, I was listening to a, a, a NPR a news thing recently about entertainment spaces and how everyone wants, everyone, everyone, quote unquote, like that the broader American public wants to get back to normal. But like the entertainment industry is one of those that is not going to be able to bounce back quickly. You mm -hmm. know, they've been closed for so long. It's like, yeah, it's a 1300 seat venue. You're not going to be able to get 1300 people in the door immediately like mm -hmm. and all the staff that it takes the back crew like you know promotions tickets i mean like all of those people are not just standing by waiting mm -hmm. for the green light like even if they were waiting for the green light you still need entertainers and the entertainers don't tour unless there's enough venues to make it worth their while mm -hmm. to like support their living and make a profit like so the whole thing is like very like uh I don't want to say dog chasing its tail, but it's cyclical. I mean, like, there's a lot of factors to it. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it is a challenge for businesses, you know, to, to try to operate. And our own LGBTQ, you know, spaces are no different. If anything, they're under that much more um, challenge to function Something in a space. Else I kind of noticed on the ones that I have seen that are still open are the ones who took it more seriously at the beginning and these are the same ones that especially on the older ones that were there for like the AIDS crisis like that they they know about health they know about what they had to do and actually stepped up early on on that side the other ones were just like we want to make as much money as we can with you as little as we put into it are yeah. the ones that are falling by the side so like the one I've been uh, had been going to as soon as they came up I mean way back in March April uh, we had stopped in briefly, and they already had stools pulled away from the bar. They had signs out front. They, I mean, they were already being proactive on it, not knowing how long it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that's still operating right now. Yeah. Uh, so I think having that 
prior awareness of what we've been through on our side as a community, um, especially with health issues, uh, the ones who've lived through that, I think, have been uh, forward thinking enough to try to keep that applied to keep their business open. What are we going to do to keep this going? Yeah. So that makes if, a lot of sense. Right. And if you're working in an industry that already has such a slim profit margin, because of the cost of labor and products, you know, that have to be converted into something else like that just poses that much more of a challenge. So I understand when, you know, the hospitality industry in general is like when you reduce this to 25 percent attendance mm -hmm. and no liquor sales or only liquor sales with a meal like I mean, like all yeah. of these mitigation measures that are being done in the effort of the public health. It does make it that much more challenging for you know a space to be um, operational. But I agree with you, Drew. Like if you were, if you were, I don't know how to say it. If you were more nimble, like flexible, uh, took it, you know, in a certain direction early on. Um, yeah. Maybe your past awareness and experience gave you that that idea. Maybe you know you're just more naturally like that as a business, as, as owners or managers. Like you know, obviously, kudos to them if they're still able to somehow keep the doors open um you know and i've seen all sorts of different things over the past year is t in terms of like trying to have business quote unquote like a whole series of bars did like drag queens bringing your meals to your car um mm -hmm. or having outdoor like entertainment type of things if they had like a parking lot you know where people could stay in their car so to speak and you might get a drink brought to your car mm -hmm. um you know while the queens or whoever was performing outdoors on a makeshift stage i mean just like it's it's really unfortunate because the reality is the only businesses that could weather this are ones that were prepaid off and had indoor and outdoor space mm -hmm. Or or had an outdoor space that could be converted like in indoor space. Like I don't know how to say that. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? Like uh, I'm thinking of establishments that basically have big garage doors. Yeah. That open to the outside, and so like they can open those and like you know do more with that kind of a space. But even so, I mean it's just so you know we're we're obviously not out of this, and we've got time to go. Mm -hmm. um, they're the, saying most things won't be fully, I mean, not even fully open. Like they're talking about, like one of the big things that, you know, I've been following is like, you were talking about entertainment. I'm talking about theater. Mm -hmm. Theater spaces won't be free and open until September is what they've been. That's kind of the target is what they've been saying. They've been mentioning right. things in like July, August, but people are saying September, like. Yeah, the um, the NPR article I listened to, they were talking to like owners, operators of theater spaces, you know, like these traveling, you know, palace locations that, you know, touring artists go to every every town kind of has at least one, if not more than mm -hmm. one, whether it be a small theater or a convention center, civic center, multiple, you know, uh, operational space. I mean, you know, black box, it doesn't matter. If it's if it's a place that has a touring artist that comes into it, their their thing is they said, you know, they were asked, like, what are you doing in terms of scheduling and what you're looking at? They said, right now we're kind of looking at Labor Day, but it's a it's an unknown. Like, will will we or won't be by that point have an idea um, as to what to do and yeah. where to go? Um, and that's where they were also talking about, like, we just can't spring back. Like, it's not a light switch. You can't turn it on, turn yeah. it off. And there's no different for our own operated spaces. True. You know, like, yeah, they can promote like, woo, like, you know, the curfews lifted or whatever, you know, and you can come in on Friday night and watch Drag Race or something or whatever. But there's still like a capacity limit. There's mm -hmm. still, you know, things that you can't do. And even if they operate a kitchen, like they can't have a ton of supply on hand. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, everything, everything is a sliding scale. Like it's all interconnected um, yeah. and affected that way. Sure. And. You know, the the concern I guess I have is, you know, um, some of us have been around in these spaces for decades now. And when you reflect on that and think back, you know, how many spaces in our own lifetime, not necessarily because of the pandemic, obviously, but like are just not there anymore. Mm -hmm. Because there is a natural life cycle to a business, but 
that being said, you know, all the history of things are gone. When I first came out into the community in Erie, I automatically was drawn to and hung around older individuals like I had most of my younger life um, prior to coming out. So I found out about, you know, the Washington Bar and Grill here in Erie and would talk to people about, you know, it's a shame we don't have a space like that anymore. And all of these older individuals in the community would just practically break their neck in whiplash and try to look at me and be like, <laughs> how the hell do you even know about that space? Like, you weren't even alive, were you? Or born? <laughs> like, like, they just were so confused that I knew about this place. And I was like, well, because I've talked to people and they talked about how much they loved this space. It was owned by a couple of lesbians and apparently they would do potlucks once a week and they supported and kind of created a local softball, like unofficial tournament team. It was very much like a collective space where people gathered mm -hmm. to, to have fun and be themselves and celebrate. And yes, there were other bars in town, but you know, everyone's kind of got their flavor. Some places are dance clubs. Some places are just holes in the walls, you know, where people just go to drink. Others are ent entertainment complexes with multiple rooms and multiple floors and an elevator. I mean, just, yeah. you know, it's all over this, the place as far as what the business could be. But the thing that I, you know, the reason I would bring it up in conversation is because there was all the stories revolved around like kind of two primary things. One was love. Like the owner operators were welcoming to everybody, didn't matter who you were. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was like, it kind of reminded me of the concept of the story uh, of the show Cheers on television. Like, everybody knows your name. Mm -hmm. And it was a local place, and it wasn't, like, there wasn't really drama, or it wasn't, like, allowed. Like, it was just very mm. much like a family kind of collective community location. Um, and, you know, it, it, and so that really kind of spoke to me because I wasn't seeing that in the bars that I was going to at the time. Um they were very much being driven by an audience of cis, white, gay, you know, people who were very absorbed in how they looked, mm. um, which was, you know, kind of parlance for the time, I guess. Um, and that's another thing, you know, is like times have changed for us as a community. So what is it that you, what purpose do you serve? What are you trying to do? Mm. Um, and I think that a lot of that is also challenging, yeah. you know, because like, well, we don't want to blame the internet. It vastly changed the course of things. I mean, I remember when the burglars were doing meeting or bar nights at the Eagle and, you know, it had come to me, not directly, but like the owner was bitching about how, you know, people weren't coming out as much because, you know, they were at home on the computer or whatever. <laughs> well, no offense. If like there are chat rooms and people could like, you know, be freaky virtually, or they could meet that way and hook up. This is pre-smartphones, pre-iPhone. Do you know what I mean? Like, but still have a way to chat with each other mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. And they don't have to spend money in your establishment, no offense, then they won't. Yeah. And that kind of resonated with me in terms of like, you know, I I had offered the idea, which fell out of flat ears, to like put some computers in the bar. <laughs> you know? You've got this whole log wall here that has this rail for drinks, but nobody stands there. Nobody uses it. So I said, I bet you if you put in a couple of computers along that wall and hooked them up to the internet, you'd get business. Mm -hmm. Didn't you and I go to a place that had that, Gary? Yes. <laughs> so I thought been... so. It was like you you could pay for like a half hour card or something to use the computer on the in the hallway. Like a so cafe. Would be out there checking their growler or their bear four one one or whatever. Well, that was the super smartphones. That was the irony of the whole thing, right? So we're in a gay <laughs> bar where people would go to hook up a cruise, right? To meet others. And then you'd see them on a computer doing the same thing virtually versus like... Anyways. It happens. It was quite funny. But no, yeah, I mean, that did, that did yeah. exist. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Um, yeah, and people, I think they... You know, they choose what they want to, but my thought was like, you know, yeah, there's additional expense, but like, you know, my thought was, but you get them in your bar. Yeah. Like if right. you get them in your bar at a low cover charge and you get them to buy drinks the whole time while they're sitting on the computer, who cares? Like you're making money that you're not making now. Mm -hmm. Yes.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. But keep it out in the open. Oh, God. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> Poor thing. How awful in your <laughs> own space that you have to get up and go get your own things. I know, right? Sounds sound like the casino. <laughs> oh my god. Anyway. Um, but no, um <laughs> agreed. I think I mean that's sort of the thing that's gonna have to happen, I think, as we reopen. Um Spaces need to either figure out, like many spaces have tried to adapt, and they're probably going to have to readapt once we go back to, you know, regular opening. They're probably going to have, like you said, they're probably going to have to look at getting staff because, you know, no offense, probably people moved on. Like, I'm sure, unless I, I doubt any bartender who has been let go has has like just sat and waited for the bar to reopen to like get their job back like I, I i highly doubt that i think they've you know figured out what something else or made a new plan or who knows what it, it could be wrong but that's kind of what i'm feeling um so you're gonna have to get staff you're gonna have to get you know <clears throat> product new you know more product i know liquor technically doesn't have an expiration date but you know that 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 food you have does um you know those snacks you serve on the wall um probably does have an expiration date so you might want you're gonna have to restock and re uh finance like you know your spaces um i know some spaces and i can't say all of them real have taken this time and while they were unable to open and have done some renovations and that's kind of a positive because you're you're reinventing your space, making it potentially accessible or friendly or modern. You know, no one likes a space to be stagnant. You know, if you have the same bar stool as you had when the bar opened in the 80s, um, might be a problem. Just saying. <laughs> um, maybe you want to, like, change things up a bit you know, some lighting, some something to just kind of help things out. Because if you can, then by all means. One of the things I think a lot of spaces have the tendency to do is become stagnant in a way. They have a lot of the same things that they had when they opened. And that's really, you know, it doesn't really help. If you look the same as you did 10, 20 years ago, there's a problem. I, you're you muted, Gary. <laughs> I was going to say, I think like I don't disagree with you, David, but there you have to make a decision as an establishment. Sure. Like, are we going to quote unquote stay up with the times, or are we willing to age ourselves and yet still be fabulously, you know, operational that people will like, you know, find it kitschy or whatever, like this this time capsule thing because eventually it will all come back around mm -hmm. um but that's a long haul trajectory i mean you know that's 25 yeah. 30 40 years before yeah. you know the you know the whatever interior <laughs> comes yeah around well I, I i might be okay if if you if you maintain that if you want to like not maintain the space at least fucking clean it mm. <laughs> well right there's 
<laughs> I mean, like, no, I, 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 agree. I mean, I don't know how many spaces I've been in during the daylight versus the night, and you're like, whoa, that, that, <laughs> this looks totally different than what I see yeah. when I'm in here, you know, when it's pitch black. Two, three, two, three, <laughs> three, <laughs> two, two, three drinks different. Fuck you. I'm I mean, talking about my the shoe should floor. not stick to the floor as I go walking through because you haven't mopped it. Mm. Or because you didn't mop it and clean it. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't know how many times people are like, oh, I mopped it. And I was like, bitch, filling a mop bucket full of water with the same dirty mop <laughs> and then like running that across the floor. It's not cleaning. You are just spreading beer and booze and putting it back in the water to spread back on the floor. Right, right, right. All you're doing <laughs> is spreading sugar and dirt. Like, honestly, yep. that's what you're doing. Yep. Because that's what most drinks are. They are sugar <laughs> and non and dirt. <laughs> well, <that's... laughs> well, the dirt's already on the floor. You're just mixing it together. There you go. Then you take it off, but then you put it back on, that sort of thing. Yeah. You yeah. know, but then I hear complaints about, well, we have to be careful about the type of cleanser we use because it'll pull the paint off the floor or strip the whatever and this and that. But and I'm like, bitch, I... Well, no, I know. It's like, I get it. But how about you, one, follow the proper instructions on the cleanser. So if it says it takes one little, like, packet of Tide Floor Cleaner, just put one in. Like, but if you hired, you know, gets it futs to be the one that washes and cleans your floors, and they're like, oh, these floors are filthy, and they dropped, like, five of them in. Yes, it futs. Who the fuck is that? <laughs> You know, but like, no, yeah, but I, I agree. It's like, oh, it's no wonder you like, you know, not only do you have to strip the floors again and rewax them, I mean, like, you know, come yeah. on. I mean, it takes, you know, some, some stuff. And, you know, if you're, if you're an establishment that allows smoking, that's a whole other mm -hmm. uh, thing to wrangle with. That's the thing about the one establishment here in the area is that they still allow smoking to this day because technically by license and per the state law, they could do that at the moment. And I'm just like, okay, like, you know, it's and, – and the thing is, is, you know, and that's a whole other aspect of our community, you know, is that the LGBTQ community is one of the highest communities of tobacco users. And I'm not going to get on a soapbox. I'm just talking about this as a generality. Like, it affects the spaces. Mm -hmm. So if the spaces allow the use of those products, then that also, you know, modifies the potential audience and the interaction. Um, some of them, you know, will allow it outdoors only. Mm -hmm. um, by you know ashtrays or or whatever i mean you know and and i'm not trying to yuck anybody's yum like there's there's a space and a place but if you if you make a decision that affects all of your patrons like that's i think the the bigger point and like you know damon you had kind of said like nobody was really prepared yeah. for the pandemic especially as a business nobody yeah. projected that and was like what would i do if like i had to cut to one fourth of my like operational income because mm -hmm. of changes in staffing changes in the audience you know what i mean mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you yeah. know <clears throat> it's 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 very different i don't again i don't think i again uh, yeah no one i think was prepared for this but some have been able to bounce back and there is like my hope and this is me being optimistic is my hope is that the space some of the spaces that have closed may find ways to reopen if necessary you know, um, if they can, you know, um, restaurants and stuff included, you know, we're, we've been talking about gay bars a lot in this one, but, you know, there are gay owned or, you know, owned restaurants and other kind of spaces out there that have suffered as well, bookstores, what have you, um, that we, you know, it'd be great if they could bounce back and come back if, if they can, but we may need to be realistic in a sense and think on things like par you mentioned parliament house has mentioned that they may be trying to find another space i think that would be awesome if they could find another space that they could open reopen and um invest in to get back into their community because that in and of itself like a 45 year 45 plus year history is devastating to think about that it's gone you know um, other spaces like I know the list. There's like the Eagles, like the DC Eagle, and other places like have been around for a long time, 
And those losing those does mean we're losing a bit of that history. Um, and yes, it would be awesome if they could come back. Um, but could they come back? And that's my like kind of caveat. It's like it it would be awesome if they could, but who knows if they can. Do we need them is becomes the ultimate question. The hit from a history perspective, yes, I think we are they're needed. Um from a a community perspective, maybe. Um I think I, I think they're that they there should be uh, if if anything at least a space. Um preferably more than one or two. But you know, if it's just one or two, that's still enough to allow uh, a place where uh, people can feel safe, that they're essentially among their own kind. I mean, a lot of this doesn't apply to me because I'm a complete homebody and social, socially awkward person. But knowing that's not the case for everybody else, having those spaces can be uh, very useful. And, mm -hmm. and and make it easier for clubs to gather, just people to gather, being able to be amongst their own people, you could say. Yeah. Um, and as I said, maybe all we really need is like one or two spaces. And I mean, it does help that because of this day and age, a lot of <laughs> non-gay specific spaces are open to have like gay groups come in and not really have have any problem or anything um and like like uh, just be like oh this gay group's gonna be in the party room of this restaurant or something like that um it, it allows more a more broad uh a group of people but uh, having that specifically gay space kind of makes it like no matter what we at least have there so i i, I think having it and i think that a lot of the things that right now i'm thinking like yeah a lot of places are closing but it could be better that they're closing now so they don't have to spend the money to maintain the current place and then uh, uh save up that money to then rebuild quote unquote anyways that's my thoughts I, I, I think too with the length of what's gone on here it, it's creating a shift in, in, in mentality or attitudes on if it had only been a couple of months it might not be the way it is now but now after a year coming up on a year of having to think and do things differently you realize how much of my out time do I need in the bar or restaurants. I mean, you, there's a shift there because you've had to live it for almost a year now, uh, a different dynamic. So mm -hmm. it goes to that, do we do we want them to come back? It, it could be, but at some point, I'm like, I've adapted enough where I've got video chats in three different states, you know, with whether it's gaming or an online happy hour or something like that. I've got friends that would rather just meet on a back patio now because of what's gone on versus being out in a 500 person club. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's a shift in, in, in thought on that, that I see with people that, yeah, I don't need to go out as much as I used to because I have new things in place now. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be something to, you'd almost, I want to say, I don't want to say overcome, but have to shift back into, that type of attitude of wanting to go out to the club, want to go do this um, outside of just traveling where there's open space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know for me personally, I've missed the the socialization of like spaces. Uh, I've missed that like gathering and being around like-minded individuals for the most part and and being engaged. Um, are not engaged. You may just be sitting there drinking, but you're still kind of in that like safe space where it doesn't 
feel odd or awkward or weird to like be who you are to hold your partner's hand or to hold someone's hand and maybe do more things with them but like the idea <laughs> behind that being that it's i know i've 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 missed that and i'm looking forward to when i can do that not like through a computer um to actually like hug someone or see a stranger or not a stranger but see a friend <laughs> and be able to 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 greet them warmly um affectionately um mm -hmm. without a mask without a hesitation of anything um and the spaces we had or have are where that can happen and could i now like go probably out to a bar and probably see people and do that probably but personally i'm not going to just for my own you know benefit mm -hmm. i've been um i think again once we once things have i keep i've said it like so many times like online like once things have calmed down um i'm looking forward to it and i think it'll be a great thing i agree with you um drew that people have adapted and they're going to have to, if they want to, they may readapt to go back either. I don't want to say backwards, but just to going back out to being in social spaces. Um, but there could be some people that are totally fine with like the way things are. And maybe they do those things. Like I think it was Peppermint that mentioned um, early on in the pandemic. She was one of the ones that was saying like, I've talked more with friends online and stuff through zoom now than i did beforehand and i want to maintain this because that's true like i like friendships and what have you i would it would be great to maintain those the way that we're doing now because of the pandemic and also have spaces that we could potentially go to and gather maybe a combination of both is what is needed or is necessary right i think it's the old with the new yeah, mm -hmm. I, th I think part of it is is before people were like, oh, this is how we've always done it. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten these abilities to do things such as, you know, uh, FaceTime, Skype, digital, uh, virtual meetings, which I don't know about you. It can be actually very convenient. You're both at, mm -hmm. at home. Maybe you're you're doing a little chat and you're like, hey, let's let's get on a, a video call and uh, uh, talk and when normally you'd be like trying to like arrange a thing but we can't but we can't like for even just five to ten minutes do a video call you can see the person you can talk to them and you find more of of this you're actually interacting well not phys physically present you're interacting with them more because you're now using these uh, uh, virtual spaces in order to interact, which ends up, you end up interacting with them more because you're not thinking, oh, we need to go see each other in person. Um, and when this does calm down, which I don't suspect it actually happening until like the end of this year, not until next year, but that's just me. But when it does start to calm down, you can then start to integrate that into your interaction flow where you'll be able to go out and, and see them and actually be in person but then there will be times when you just get on a video call and you mm -hmm. end up having more of an interaction instead of less interaction it's just that now you're you're just rolling into your your interactions of being virtual as well as being physical so Mm -hmm. And being forced into having to use the virtual more helps, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of get used to the to the times and the technologies and stuff when before you just didn't bother because you could mm -hmm. easily you could get together. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I'm holding reservation on how things will be when we get to the other side. And the reason is, is 
so a lot of individuals who may have learned that they're not really people persons, <laughs> I think might continue in their like their habits that they've established, their patterns of not really going and doing things. I mean, yeah, there will be a little bit more comfortable like uh, liberty to know that you can go to the market when you need to go to the market mm -hmm. as opposed to strategically planning when to go when it's, you know, uh, you know, the most safer or, or whatever. Um, but I don't, I mean, I'm, I think there's a lot of talk about going back to normal, but I agree with the concept, like what was normal yeah. is what normal will be. Um, if, you know, here in the U S the current administration, the new administration is able to achieve the goals of what they're talking about. Yes. Quite potentially we could have enough vaccination available for the entire U S population by the end of summer. Whether or not the entire U.S. population does get vaccinated is a whole other matter, though. Um, right. You know, if if the people that have been trying and attempting to keep things safe, you know, go out and get vaccinated, yeah, it's quite possible we could at least get half the nation, you know, vaccinated. Um, but then what? You know, like, I mean, if, if herd immunity is really when we get between 60 and 80 percent, um, you know, vaccination, um, then where do we go from there? And, you know, I, like, so I think there's there's much yet to be discovered or determined. Um, and my fear is, is that we're going to have these hotspot outbreaks that will keep popping up until something happens and i don't know if it will actually be like people getting their shit together yeah. and realizing like oh you know like what happened at thanksgiving as an example you know like mm -hmm, all mm -hmm. these families gathering together and then the family's getting sick and mm -hmm. we also have the superb owl today true well <laughs> right i mean to be fair I did hear on the news, which cracked me up, that there wasn't expected to be a whole lot of, like, congregating. And part of that is just because of the weather. Like, it is cold across the nation. <laughs> period. <laughs> so, like, even the hotter spots of the country are not necessarily hot. Um, 43 so degrees here in Austin, Texas. Right. 4 <laughs> degrees here. <laughs> Shut up. That's awful. Uh, that's that's asked, like, you know, that is awesome in my opinion <laughs> well it's 21 here so i mean i it doesn't i mean the, the the degrees are variable but the reality is even for it being 43 people do not necessarily want to be outside especially when you're used to like 70 80 90 you know that's that's not your you know your comfort level so i'm 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 kind of intrigued to see if there won't be much that comes out of you know today's big game situation mm -hmm. because people are like, I want to be outside, right? Fuck like first of all, right? Yeah, like fuck it, I don't want to be outside. And then second <laughs> of all, no one's really willing to have a party of any sort. I mean, there will be some people. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, like, um, but I think people are being much more um, aware mm -hmm. and paying attention to things. And I and I don't like the fact that I feel like it's falling into two camps. The camp of caution and the camp of fuck it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like it's just kind of how people are behaving or, or operating. But true. You know, I mean, I I can understand it to a certain point. And um, I'm a little bit concerned personally that people will think like, you know, oh, I've been vaccinated, you know, and then they get their booster, you know, three, four <laughs> weeks later. And how they turn around and they're like, well, I'm good now. Like, I can do whatever the hell I want. Uh, no. no. No, it doesn't. No, all it means is that you're not going to get severely ill. You're not going to be hospitalized. It does not prevent you from passing it on to anybody else. That's, that's, that's not how this works. That's exactly. not how any of this works. <laughs> right. So, you know, people like like it's still like that viewpoint is very self centered. Yeah. Like I got mine. <laughs> that's nice. You know, and, and, and I, I feel for people when they are posting online about how their parents get, get, get vaccinated and they're trying and yet they're upset because then they see other people that can get in line. So, yes, the vaccination distribution program in the U.S. is incredibly broken. It has yeah. been since it started. Um, and there are strides being made 
to change things, mm -hmm. but it takes time. Um, you know, nationwide rollout of vaccinations through the through the pharmacy networks is huge, but it will take time. And and there's only so much supply. Like that's one of the things that kind of intrigues me is like there's a supply and a demand thing. And if our public education system failed us anywhere, this would be one of those things mm -hmm. where it's not explaining to the, you know, to the available people. It kind of goes all the way back to those like word math problems and be like, if I have three apples for the four of us, how do we share the three apples? And some people might be like, well, one person just doesn't get an apple. <laughs> Bitch, that's not equity. That's not like you know what I mean. Like, and and, and so you know that's that's one of the the parts I think that kind of fails is that people don't Sally understand. Ain't no fucking apples. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think this is what kind of fails people though is just like general concepts like that and be like, you know, there's only so much, you know, so many shots, so much stuff going around, and yes, mm -hmm. it is a flawed system because. You know, some people don't show up for appointments, which leaves a leftover shot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, accidents do happen. Like, you know, freezers break and you suddenly have to, like, utilize vaccine that, you know, isn't going to be viable anymore. Um, so, yeah, there's there's lots of stuff potential yeah. to, like, you know, be taken into account. My hope is, like, in another 60 days, we're going to see vast improvements in the whole distribution program and that people will feel more comfortable um, if, if an individual, um, finds, you know, that they are able to, you know, get the shot, um, and it may, you know, and, and I get it. There was a, a, the reason it was on my mind is it was on the news recently about this whole thing and how is it ethical to cross county lines because they have different parameters in that county that would allow you to get a shot where you can't get a shot in your own county. Um, you know, are you jumping the line if you're notified about a vacant spot at the last minute? Like all these like kind of morality kind of questions were really intriguing to me because at the end of all of this, the goal is to get everyone vaccinated, at least mm. the, the hope. So, you know, what you can do and where you can um, is, I think, a, a key aspect of it. And once we get more availability and ease of, of access, then folks will um feel more comfortable about the next decisions that they can make but whether or not you know we will see these spaces resume or come back or in some cases as being listed they're they're closing but they're moving because mm. their landlord you know or whatever is being unreasonable about you know rent and, and other stuff um yeah we'll we'll have to kind of wait i guess mm. and go from from there but i i mean i posted recently um on social media like i realized like i miss spaces to like uh have connections with people mostly little you know, people i already know but to just hang out mm -hmm. like that that's the one key thing that it hit me this past week as i was like man like i just <laughs> like it's it's now been a year and I realize I don't go out. Like, yeah. I knew I kind of didn't go out before, but now I really don't go out. Like, you know, the men's group, we haven't been out to dinner in a year now. Um, I think February last year might have been the last time. Um, and, you know, not having events, not having places to go to, mm -hmm. any of that kind of stuff. You know, like to hang out with friends in a place. <laughs> you know over a meal or or and or drinks or whatever like all of that has just not been there um and i think that is making a bit of a crisis not only for the businesses but just for us as a population um who is very socially engaged whether we do it virtually digitally or, or in person um i think a lot of that is has uh changed no okay. so i'm i mean i'm optimistically looking forward to to later this year when things mm -hmm. can hopefully open up so uh you know whether or not these these businesses within our community are going to be able to recover i think is a little bit of an unknown the fact that the administration is trying to get more money available to businesses um i'll be curious to see how that works out that. yeah I'm and, trying and to if it, it, that too. well and if it's grants 
good. If it's loans, not so good. No. Yeah. Because that's borrowing on future business you don't even know if you're going to have. That's the worst part. And so, you know, I'm I'm a little bit concerned for businesses that take on these loans to be able to pay today's bills, not knowing whether or not they're going to have be able to pay the bills and then some in the future. I'm not saying it's a bad decision. It's just um, more disconcerting to me mm-hmm. about, you know, what the, the other effects will be in time. So on this particular uh, thing on the on blog on the website, we're going to have a list of um, some places that we know about that have closed. We also put together a series of articles talking about this very subject. And lo and behold, I did find Wikipedia does have a page called Impact of the COVID-19 Pandemic on the LGBTQ Community. Um, it is meant to encompass the whole world. In the U.S., it lists a whole bunch of events that were canceled last year and then has a whole section about um, – the bars and restaurants. Mm. So this is, uh, it's not, it's not the full list that I was kind of hoping someone had somewhere, but it's better. It's something. Um, <laughs> when those things where it might be a little hard to get a, get a full list because there's so many different sources that they have to look up and it's complicated. Let's just say that, but we got something. Well, it, right. And I know over the past year, I've heard like in various podcasts or seen it posted online in different ways that people have been sharing about spaces that are going away or closing or fundraising. Um, but I was just realizing like, yeah, there really is no centralized mm-hmm. like database, of, you know, pulling all of that together. At least it doesn't seem to be. And that's unfortunate because we could really, I think, as a community benefit from that. Um, and I would have preferred if, like, you know, HRC or um, not, maybe not Lambda Legal, but, you know, like some entity or those and others collectively came together, you know, like GLAD and stuff and was like, hey, this is our history. Like, we should really be making an effort to document this as tragic as it is. But. Hindsight's twenty twenty. It may be like later this year that someone kind of realizes, like, oh, perhaps we really should, you know, kind of track that stuff. So, mm-hmm. time will tell. But yeah, I, uh, I feel very much like that. Like, you know, if I had an eight ball, it would be like, you know, uh, what is it? Out Outlook Unknown. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know that you just kind of don't know what the 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 future will be um yep 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 yeah ask yep. again later <laughs> <laughs> well that's what we got for you uh hopefully we'll have some spaces after this pandemic's over uh and hopefully some of those who hope to reopen near reopen even if it's not in their original space um but uh, support your local businesses, folks, wherever possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know what? That sounds like it's the end. Oh. There's plenty of ways to contact us. Let us know about your gay spaces uh, over at CubsOutLoud.com, where you can comment on the blog. Uh, shoot us an email at CubsOutLoud at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail at 361 talks. That's 361-265-8255. You can find, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and YouTube at Cubs Out Loud in the appropriate place of the URL. Join our entourage chat when you can see when we're recording really, really early compared to our normal stuff uh, over at Telegram, at, at tinyurl.com slash telegram dash col. Uh, you can also subscribe to our Google Calendar, which wasn't quite accurate because the, 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 the event was not updated, but that's okay. Uh, that's over at tinyurlcom slash calendar dash col. You can get merchandise such as a Cubs Out Loud shirt. Um, I think that both me and Gary are wearing in different versions. Mm-hmm. Uh, or other Kuchiman, like a like a col mug <laughs> uh, in various styles over at zazzle.com slash Cubs Out Loud. You can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud or you can Send up some cash. See if we can prove our our stuff by going to paypal.me slash comes out loud. Uh, you can subscribe and rate us over on Apple Podcast, Google Play, uh, which I think that's somehow changing somehow, but I didn't look too much into that. Um, Spotify and Amazon and Audible. 
<laughs> find me anywhere in the internet as box that box puppy box cub box something or other or on wednesdays and thursdays you can find me over on twitch at twitch.tv slash windgem that's w-y-n-d-g-e-m if you wish to get in touch with me you can find me as theater cup 79 on most bear related sites are on facebook or you can find me as pup underscore umbra on twitter if you'd like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GearBear73. Drew, if anyone would like to reach out uh, and get in contact reach with you. Out, touch, touch, touch me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find me in most places either as OHMI Bear, like Ohio Michigan Bear, or more recently as The Wandering Bear or Drew the Wandering Bear. Mm. Not doing much wandering nowadays, but. <laughs> I can just time. wander in the woods. There's no one out there. Uh-huh. <laughs> Stay away. I got a stick. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, with that, uh, yeah. Happy Super Bowl, everybody. <laughs> Ciao for now. Bye.